Why don't you go ahead and grab a seat? Yeah, right. That's all right. Move this out of the way. Pop it up here. All righty. All right. Well, we're already uh, Second Timothy, and uh, it goes fast. I can't believe that we're already in Second Timothy, and and we'll get a chance to jump into that about halfway, and then we'll have to uh, probably finish it on another day. And let me see here. I did forget something in my bag here that we're going to need. You would think I would be ready. There we go. All right, well, let's pray. This had to be Tim, because I can't. There we go. <laughs> there. I knew something was wrong. It was way up here. <laughs> yeah. Father, thank you for um, just humor. Thank you that we can rejoice, we can be serious, of course, and we can also enjoy one another, and thank you for that. Now, bless and encourage us. Uh, today, as we look into Second Timothy, uh, we don't want just to be an exercise, a calendar event. It's it's Wednesday, so we're all here. We want it to be meaningful. We want to uh, hear about your word, uh, what you're doing uh, in these uh, letters, these epistles, and uh, may we glean truth. May we be serious uh, um, uh, students of the Bible. May may it continue to change us. May we not take ourselves seriously, but may we take uh, you very, very seriously, and thank you for that. Thank you that not only are we saved and uh, redeemed and and uh, right with you through the uh, righteousness of Christ, we're so thankful for that. Help us now to continue to grow. Help us understand the scriptures the best we can so that we can um, use them as a surgical tool, a surgical way of, of sharing the gospel with others. So thank you, we pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, anybody would like to share anything? We've been sharing testimonies. If anybody wants to share anything, does, I know Tim did that in choir and uh, heard a couple things, but does anybody want to share anything from the week? You can make it up or whatever. <laughs> if you know I'm going to ask it every week, then maybe I'll save one thing. All right. No? Oh, sure. Harmony. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, no doubt. Those those girls up there at the college just love her. They just flock around. You know, uh, on Wednesday, I think it is, they have the elective, and so they have her always teaching. It's like all the girls are in that uh, room there. She really connects with them, and so I'm glad that was. You know, I was looking at the schedule on the first night you guys were there, and I said, oh, I wonder what they're going to do tonight. And I saw the one was shooting. Who? How many of you guys went out to the... To the range. How about that? Did you hit anything? Jessica? Yeah? Wow. Look at you. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that was kind of neat. All right. Well, uh, let's take our Bibles and open up to the book of 2 Timothy. And guess where it is? Where all the T's are? And so it's 2 Timothy, and then next is Titus, our last T. Okay, you there? Second Timothy, short chapter. Okay, as you know, and you probably aware of this, this is a seasoned crowd here. Um, as you know, a person's last words many times are their best words. Sometimes when you get down to the very end, and maybe uh, like when my mom was passing, uh, our conversations were very poignant, uh, very very articulated, uh, very clear. They were not you know, rambling all over the place. I mean, death was at the door, and uh, we were waiting almost for that moment, so every conversation with her uh, was things that she wanted to uh, share with us. And so we, we know that, that usually, in fact, uh, the police even say that a 
a deathbed confession is taken as absolute truth because usually they want to clear their conscience. So a lot of times when they, when they get something like that, somebody wants to clear their mind, uh, they find it to be true. So we know that when a person gets to the end of their life, sometimes those are their best words. They really want to communicate uh, you know, something that's really on their heart. But then um, uh, by then, life seems to have distilled into its most significant thoughts. So in other words, it's time to get serious. It's time to say what you want to say. We tend to listen to people when they are about to leave this planet, when they're about to leave Earth. I remember some of my last visits with Charles Holmshire, the founder of Bible Time. I remember going out to Colorado and spending some time with him as he was uh, winding down pretty quickly. Um, our conversations were no longer about the day-to-day -day affairs of MBT. Sometimes he would call me and it took everything I had to keep my eyes open, you know, because it was late at night and it was just talking about the, you know, the, the everyday affairs of it. It was, it was difficult to stay focused sometimes later at night. But when I was out there with him, um, uh, they were very encouraging conversations. A lot of it was just a little bit about his history. He would talk a lot about when he was a kid and how he got his name and about his mom. And he would just, things that I never really knew about him. And I talked a lot about his faith. Talked a lot about his faith. Um, he said that he was always going to be a farmer, and he had bought his first used uh, tractor, a Ferguson plow. I don't know, you know exactly what that all was, and he was excited. Uh, this would have been, let's see, he was born in 25, so we're talking probably about, you know, uh, when he was a 20-year-old or whatever, and he had the field that he was going to farm, and he said one day he was out there farming and plowing, and he stopped. And he said, you know what, I think God's got other fields for me to plow. And he sold his truck, I mean, sold the truck, sold the um, uh, the here, and he uh, went off to Bible college and uh, started Neighborhood Bible Time. And look at the fruit that that's produced over these 70-some years. Uh, they had shifted to the journey ahead, and what he wanted to share with me was his life, his instructions, the exhortation he wanted to uh, uh, um, share with me, and I appreciate that. They were frank and honest conversations with no guile. They were pretty, pretty, pretty to the point. So before we take um, on, before we take on the study of the scriptures, we need to try to put ourselves in the shoes of the person who wrote the letter. So, in other words, just like those conversations. Also, when we're studying the scriptures, we want to make sure that we get ourselves involved in. Uh, the person that wrote the letter, kind of get to know who they are, uh, what type of person were they in the scriptures, what, were the, what was their character like. So in other words, like this, if we're going to study the book of uh, uh, the Church of Corinth, um, then you ought to join the Church of Corinth. What I mean by that is know all about it, know about who the pastor was, who Paul was, how it started, what was his passion. Really, really, if we're going to really understand a letter, We've got to go deeper than just reading through the Bible. We've got to stop and pause and study and go deeper than just the surface to really glean that truth. Um, if you're going to preach on 1 Corinthians, then join 1 Corinthians. Uh, put yourself in a dungeon if you're going to talk about 2 Timothy, because that's where Paul is. We've got to know where's Paul writing this letter from, what, what's going on in his life, how old is he? What's taking place? Because if we can glean that information, it helps us to understand a little bit more. Or if you're going to counsel anyone, you must enter into their grief. You must take time with them. You must listen. So the book of Timothy is brief, but if we put ourselves in the shoes of Paul, it will take on a whole new meaning. We understand what's going on in his life. It will give us a fresh eyes to this little book that has a relevant relevant message for you and also for me. So let's talk about this a little bit before we get into uh, digging through the book itself. The man who writes this letter is writing his final words. Uh, he's probably about his mid-60s. Uh, he, uh, um, he says in his own words in 2 Timothy 4.7, if you want to look at that, 2 Timothy 4.7, in fact, this made me call my daughter Samantha today. Uh, I was uh, studying this and uh, was reading this uh, verse. I, I put everything down. I got on the phone with her and I said, Samantha, I think I remember you telling me that this was your 
uh, favorite verse when you were going through uh, college? She goes, yeah. She goes, it still is one of my favorites, that and uh, Nahum 1.7. But she used to always write this. I always saw it like written on her wall. I saw it you know, written many times in her Bible. 2 Timothy 4.7, Paul said, I have fought a what? Good fight. That tells us a lot about Paul. He was a fighter. He fought a good fight. He stayed with it. That makes a big difference as we look at this letter. Now he's at the end of his life. He's 65, 66, 67. Who knows exactly how old. He's in a dungeon. He's in prison. He's away from everybody. Might be feeling a little lonely, a little bit on his own. And he says, I have fought a good fight. I have what? Finished my course. He finished it. Hey, listen to me. It's not how you start. Everybody starts. Everybody starts. It's how you finish. It's easy to start. It's hard to finish. I have kept what? The faith. He has kept the faith. That's quite a testimony. So we have a letter written to us from a dying man in a dungeon. And if we really take time, which we don't tonight because we're just doing a survey trip, but if we were to go through all that Paul experienced, we would see that his armor that he put on, according to Ephesians chapter 6, uh, that he penned the armor of God, it would probably be pretty dented up. I have a feeling some of us are so careful about our own comfort that our armor is going to look awful intact. Our, our armor ought to be pretty well bent and dinged up from the wiles of the devil, from the fight, from the battle. Some of us, our armor looks brand new and we've been wearing it for 40, 50 years. And so that wasn't the case with Paul. So he's a dying man, he's in a dungeon. Now I know that jails back then were a little different than the jails today. Uh, the jails today are uh, got some pretty good food. And they've got uh, probably cable TV and they probably have a little bit of everything there. And um, these dungeons a lot of times were just holes in the ground. There was an area where you entered in, but a lot of times they would dig down and then there might be like a hole in the ceiling to bring some type of light into the dungeon area, but they were not well taken care of. In fact, did you know that if you didn't have a good friend, you might not eat? Because a lot of the dungeons and jails, you had to have somebody bring you food and take care of you. That wouldn't fly today, would it? <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. That's right. So this is what we have here. Now, we're not learning all about Paul, but we're kind of seeing here the letter, the letter carries with it a great deal of impact. Perhaps it might not have, other, um, have not otherwise been that way if we, if we didn't understand a little bit about Paul. So it's good to know your writer. It's good for you when you get to a book to kind of study and, 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 and learn a little bit about the historical. You know, who was the writer and what was going on in his life? How old was he at the time? The man who wrote the letter identifies himself in the very first verse. So in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, he says, well, we'll just do verse 1. He says, Paul, an apostle, identifies himself right there. He goes on, of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. A little mini gospel right there. Certainly isn't cover everything, but we see that promise of life, which is in who? Christ Jesus. So he's an apostle. His name is Paul. This is Paul's last will and testament is what we're reading here. That's what 2 Timothy is about. 2 Timothy is about a dying man that has something to say. And he wants to get that out and he wants to get it out clearly so that those that hear it can pick up the baton. Let me tell you something. The goal of every believer is to pass the baton. Who's going to pick up the baton of those that, that die? That's, it's us. We need to pick it up, and then we need to carry it until we're ready to hand it off as well. And Paul was, was, was really writing that in this letter that, um, that uh, things go on. Now, Paul was a great leader, but can I tell you something right now? That Paul had nothing more than what you and I have. He had the Holy Spirit, and so do we. It's not like Paul was superhuman. It, it was like Paul was endowed with different grace than we have. 
He had to get up and he had to battle the flesh because we know that from chapter 7. The things I want to do, sometimes I don't do them, and the things I don't want to do, the things I do. We, we can enter into that and say, yeah, I've been there or I'm there a lot of times. So grace doesn't run out on the dying generation of great leaders. It just passes the baton. So those that are you that are younger and you're looking at us that are older and you see, you know, that we're getting closer and closer to that moment of either the rapture, of course, or, or death, you should be ready to pick up the baton. We see that with Joshua with Moses, don't we? We see that with Elijah and Elisha, right? Elisha's following him everywhere he goes. And so these, the, this generation behind us ought not to see how they can get ahead of us and take over the roles we have. They ought to come alongside us and help us until God places you in that position and then run with it, whatever that might be. So the passing of the baton is important in a track meet. If you drop it, what happens? Get disqualified if you don't pass it the right way. So they, they spend hours and hours and hours and hours and hours on practicing that. And we too ought to take uh, the baton seriously as it passes from generation to generation to generation. So the letter, the letter carries a uh, great impact now that we know this. So this is Paul's last will and testament. This is the final words. This is the final and some would say the best letter for us who have followed after Paul. If you know much about Paul, this is the letter. This is it. This is the letter saying, hey, I'm leaving. I'm taking off. I'm, I'm, I'm out of here soon. I'm, I, I've been sentenced to death. I'm not going to live much longer. And I want to get everything out that I need to get out. A gentleman I read, John R. Stout, said in his book, guard the gospel. That's what this is all about, too, is guarding the gospel. Uh, uh, back then, in, in, in the years that these were written in the 1800s, a lot of them were called bishops. Bishop Hanley Mule, M-U-L-E, confessed that he found it difficult to read Paul's second letter to Timothy. Just found it difficult. And he said this, quote, without finding something like a mist gathering in his eyes when he read it. He was just overwhelmed that this man's life, Paul, and all that the Lord did in his life, and then to read this and, and this, this second letter, knowing that he was going to be leaving, it, 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 it impacted him. Have you had somebody go before you that has had a lasting impact on you? You may bring a tear to your eyes and the impact that maybe they had on your life. And this is the way uh, Timothy probably felt about Paul. Uh, this is understandable. This is the very moving human document. This is, uh, it's, uh, as you read it, if you can, I would really recommend that you should try to read every letter from cover to cover. Of course, that's hard with Isaiah because it's 66 chapters. It's a lot, Ezekiel. There's a lot in there. But in these littler letters, these epistles, when you study them, you ought to just take it and read it from, from, from chapter 1, verse 1, to the last chapter, uh, to the last verse, and, and try to read it through as a whole letter. That's the intent of it. It's sometimes hard if we just pick and choose certain things, but get, a, get the breath of everything that is Paul saying. And this will help you, too, because you might want to write in your Bible there, as we'll talk a little bit more about it. But this is Paul's last will and testament. This is, this is, this is his words as a dying man to not only Timothy, but really for all generations, for us too. So it's relevant for us even today. Um, we are to imagine the Apostle Paul, the age languishing in some dark, dank dungeon in Rome, from where there would be no escape but death. But instead of rather to to call his attorney or to worry about his rights or to, uh, to fight it. He chose rather uh, than simply die in obscurity, is a, in silence. He writes a friend whose name appears in the second verse. So he's going to write a letter. I was thinking about this. I would think it would be good for us, well, really probably for all of us to keep a journal. Um, I keep a journal that's my private journal, and then I keep a journal for my girls. I don't write everything in the private journal. is not for them. Those are just my thoughts for my thing. But I have a journal for them to read and, um, or, or things that I want to say to them. And I would say that that might be something you might want to consider doing, writing a letter to your children. 
write that letter and have it have it out there, especially as you get older and your children get older. It's hard to write about Luke already because you don't you know much to, to to know about his personality. But if the Lord tarries and you guys have life, you know when he's thirty, or he would really appreciate that. I bet to read something from his parents that was stirring in their heart all through his life. So I would challenge you to think about that. He chose rather, though, to write this letter. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, he says in there, if you look there, 2 Timothy 1, 2 says, To Timothy, who, how does he address him? By what? Yeah. So either he had some part, uh, uh, which I believe he did, of his salvation, or maybe he's the one that uh, led him to the Lord, or possibly, you know, some, some people don't have a father. Some people grow up. There might be a father in the home, but there's really no relationship. There might be a father that they've never met, maybe because of death. They just died at an early age, or maybe um, they just don't live in the same home, whatever that might be. And sometimes um, uh, an older man like Paul became, for Timothy, it was like his father. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Timothy is in the prime of his life. He really is. He's in the prime of his life. He's at that great age where everything is working probably and he can really go after it. And, um, and he's probably engaged in all kinds of activities. We know he is and perhaps even a difficult ministry in the city of Ephesus. That's where he was charged to go. So I bet uh, he probably had a lot of questions on Paul. How do I handle this? How do I, how do I handle this church? There's so much going on. Can you give me some advice? And Paul would certainly be able to, to help Timothy just to keep on keeping on. And we'll find in that letter, he does admonish uh, Timothy not to quit and to be faithful. Hey, can I tell you the best admonishment or the best friend you could have is one that would encourage you to keep on keeping on. Somebody that really would, would push you and, um, and, 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 and tell you to, to end strong, to finish the course, to finish the race that God has for you. Don't deviate. Don't waste years. Uh, use all your life completely for him. And so uh, Paul, the aged, wanted to pass on to Timothy, the younger, some words of advice concerning ministry and concerning living. Those are two key things, right? Ministry and living. Uh, the exact prison he wrote from in Rome is not stated uh, wherever it was. But if you take your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy, or of chapter 1, though, you're probably in 1, and look at verses uh, 16 and 18, 16, 17, and 18. This tells us a little bit about where he was. It says, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me. Wow. I tell you what, I love people that call me and refresh me. I really do. That's so encouraging. We all, we all, we all make that a regular practice, and, and this, was, this was important to uh, Paul, and was not ashamed of my chains. So not only Paul was he in prison, but he was chained. Because it says so right here. He was not ashamed of chains, but when, but when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently, so it wasn't easy to find him. It wasn't like, you know, where's Paul? Oh, he's over here. He had to search him out. He diligently went after. He went there with a purpose to be a blessing to this dear brother. He sought me out very diligently, the scripture says, and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus. Thou knowest very well. Uh, this was a good friend. That word minister is an interesting word. So we learn from the text that Paul was in chains, he was in Rome, he was hard to find, he was ministering unto Paul, he had a sentence of death, he was in a dungeon, he had something to say. The word minister is to be an attendant, that is to wait upon or to serve. It's the same word that we use for deacon, deaconess, for the deacons. It was, a, um, it was the same word, to serve. And so this young man would come alongside Paul at Ephesus and now again and just serve him. What do you need, Paul? What is it? Can I bring you food? What is it that you need? I just want, I just want to serve you. I just, want, I just want to be there for you. You know, in America, 
we have a tendency when someone gets a certain age to just disregard them and throw them out like a piece of trash, they, like they have no value. Maybe because they don't have as much um, energy or they're not able to, to do certain things anymore. We just like discount them like they had no life at all. No, we ought to be like this young man. We ought, we ought to come along those that um, as they get older and serve them and help them and be with them. They have a lot to give. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, he says, Wherein I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. So here he was, he, he was called an evildoer. He, he, he suffered trouble even though he was for the faith. It wasn't anything that he did wrong. He, he, was, he was locked up basically illegally. But the word of God is not bound. Paul suffered hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal for the sake of the gospel. But that was his lot. He never complained about it. In fact, when Silas and Paul were imprisoned and beaten, what did they do at midnight? They sang. They sang praises. Not too many people would do that. We would all, we'd want our rights. We'd want to know, why am I in here? We'd be yelling and screaming and complaining. But they just gave it over to the Lord. That was the lot that God had for them for the faith. For the faith. And, of course, uh, that started the first prison ministry because that prison guy got saved and his family as well. So um, I'd like to also read here just some things that, so we can, before we jump into the letter, we can understand the mind of Paul because we want to kind of walk in his steps a little bit. So in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9, 2 Timothy 4, 9, we're going to read some um, verses here. Uh, he says, do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. Almost like Paul's talking, hey, listen, um, I need to see some people. We need that human contact. Hey, is God the answer? Always is. But God uses us to come alongside other people. He really does. Don't discount the importance of the church, fellowship, and friendship. It's important to come alongside people when they're hurting they're going through tough times, and Paul was saying, hey, you know, I'm in a hole. I'm chained up. I mean, I'm, 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 this is it. And he says, so come shortly unto me, for Demas have forsaken me, have loved this present world. So maybe Paul spent a lot of time with Demas, maybe something along the line there, but he, he forsake him, this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica and these other places. And then he says, only Luke is with me. And he says, take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is what? Profitable to me for the ministry. Antichesis, have I sent to Ephesus? And he says, the cloak that I left at uh, Troas makes me feel better because I'm always leaving my, clothes, leaving my clothes everywhere. So he left his co uh, uh, coat there as well with Carpus. When thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but what? Especially the what? He wanted the scriptures. He wanted the scriptures. So, so, so do you understand Paul's heart? I mean, he's human like we are. Maybe he was lonely. Um, maybe he was scared a little bit. I don't know. He was going to probably lose his head. He's going to die a brutal death. And he's just recounting this. And he says, then he goes on and says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. That's the way that we ought to respond to those that have hurt us. Give it to the Lord. Let the Lord seek the revenge. Because the Lord is always just and right in what he does. We don't. We don't want to operate out of anger. And so he says, hey, listen, Lord, you know what's going on. Uh, we'll leave it right in your hands. Um, of whom um, be thou aware also, for he have greatly withstood our words. So he was, he, was, he was a difficult person to have around. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. So, so even though we hear a lot about Paul, there were some difficulties there in his ministry. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work 
and will preserve me unto this heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Do thy diligence. Come before winter is in verse number 21. So maybe Paul really needed that coat. Maybe he was worried about the weather. They wouldn't be able to get to him. But that, that kind of hit me there. Do thy diligence. Come before winter. He was saying, hey, I really need you. I, I, I need some friends. I need someone to come alongside of me. You ever been going through a difficult time? It's hard to go through it alone. It's a lot better when someone just comes along and just sits with you or holds your hand or, or um, runs those errands or just, just, you're just there. You're just there. And uh, so uh, we take time to slow down to learn doctrine and principles, of course, that's the whole purpose of preaching, was we want to persuade by principles. And, but let's not forget the human difficulties of geographic, geographically as well. In other words, sometimes uh, we just need to come alongside people, even if we don't know exactly what they're going through. We just, we just have to come alongside them. Maybe in the past, you have felt all alone. Have you ever been in a room with a lot of people, but you feel alone? You ever feel that way before? You just... It can be very busy, everybody's having a great time, and you're like all alone. Just, just a lot on your mind, a lot on your heart, and those are difficult times. Maybe you remember that. Uh, maybe sometimes we feel cold, or maybe we feel forgotten, or maybe we feel removed or shelved. Uh, maybe that's the way you feel right now, and nobody really even knows it. So it's good for us to share that. Paul was. I think Paul was saying, hey, come on. Come on, come visit me. Come, come, come alongside me and serve me and, and be here. I need you during this time. This is a difficult time that he was going through. So sometimes we can be in a place, we can be around many, but yet still feel, still feel very much alone. In times of loneliness, we need, to, we need friends. We have the Lord. He's our great comforter. We know that. But he does use human touch. Human touch. See, if we're not willing to walk in somebody else's shoes, we'll have a hard time ministering to them because we'll say, well, listen, just pull up your bootstraps and come on, get out of that depression. Just come on, just get on, put on your, your, uh, your daddy pants and go, you know, what, 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 what's, what's all this stuff? Just get up and go. We're just not trusting the Lord. Where's your faith? And that's wrong thinking. Sometimes they might have little faith. Maybe they have no faith. Maybe they're just so overwhelmed, they don't know which way to go, and coming alongside them is, gonna, is very important, and it's a great ministry of helps. Sometimes when we're so squared away, we can't help people that are hurting because we just can't understand why they can't succeed like we have. And sometimes there's just something there that they just need. They just need. And it might have been because of their own fault. It might have been their own sin that caused it, but it was still... We're still called to come alongside them. So be an encouragement. Paul, in the midst of facing death, gathers himself together to send an urgent missile to Timothy. But not to Timothy alone, but to us today who are carrying the baton. So those of us that are growing older, we should, considered, um, we should consider um, the age. So those that are growing older... Remember this, and this is an encouragement. I'm, I'm in that boat now. I wasn't in that boat before, but I'm in it now. You're not through. You might have not have the strength, but you have much to say. I'm thankful for those that have walked the miles I haven't walked or have been to the places I haven't been. And I encourage you to write letters to those who will follow you. You have valuable words to pass on to the generations that are behind you, no matter how old you are. This will be the ones who pick up the baton and will run the race, race, invest in them. Let them witness the grace of God uh, through your life, no matter what age you are. Uh, you have value, and God can use you uh, mightily. When you write, uh, it will not be inspired scripture, but it will be needed. It will be needed. Uh, sometimes when, uh, when Brother Holmesher died, um, his daughter asked me if I wanted his Bible, and I said, yes, you bet. And so I took his Bible, and um, in fact, I used it at Daniel Grab's uh, wedding. I used Brother Holmesher's 
exact words of uh, marriage. I had never done that before, and I opened it up, and there he had it all written right in there. You know, exactly how to say, you know, you take her, you take him, so on. All the way through that, and I've read in there thoughts that he's had, and sometimes I wonder, I wonder why he wrote that. And so I, I get to read that. Listen, leave that behind. Uh, you that are getting older, and I am too, uh, write our words down. Let, let, let people have them. Um, uh, sit down with these younger ones and, and help them understand uh, how God is faithful because you have a track record of God working in your life. It'll be important. It's important to listen to those who have walked by faith. So if you're in here young, don't disregard the older. They have a lot of value. They've been through a lot. They can really help you out. When I was going through what we did with my daughter, it was an older man that sat me down and pointed his crooked finger at me and straightened me out because I was thinking wrong. Praise God for that man. The passing of the generation ahead of us is also the passing of an heir. When this older group leaves, like all the, the, almost all the World War II people are gone. What a generation that was. Those that are younger, they'll, they'll never quite understand the advantage we had meeting some of those World War II vets and all that they went through. And so when a generation dies, there's a passing of an heir too. So get to know those that have walked before us, some of the things that they've gone through and had to live by faith and trust the Lord in many different areas. So young people, catch all you can from those who are aged because they've walked by faith and their wisdom is priceless. Priceless. Okay. So now we know a little bit about Paul. He's in a dungeon. He's uh, facing death. Uh, he, he got some friends coming to help him. So the style of this letter is that it's urgent. Paul writes this letter is urgent. He wants to get it out. He wants to get this letter written. He needs to get it out to young Timothy and even us today. There could be an exclamation point after the letter. It should say, 2 Timothy, exclamation point. Let's get busy with this. this is, there's important information in here. There's life-changing information in this letter. There's a lot of commands and contrast found in this letter that we'll see. If you read this letter from the first word to the last, you will see the wisdom of Paul to those he want, wants to accomplish the Lord's will. And the basic thing is get busy. Get busy. Quit, quit wasting your life. Quit, quit allowing all these distractions in your life. Lay them aside. It's not worth it. And he says, get up and get moving. And the Lord will do things that you can't even imagine. The letter that needs to be read, I believe, in one sitting will help. So look at, let's look at some of those uh, commands. Um, if you want to take your, um, your, your, your Bibles there and put on um, chapter number one, the overriding thing there is guard the truth. Guard the truth. Uh, we can't change the scriptures. We need to guard the truth. We don't want to take the scriptures and twist them and turn them and make them what they're not. And that's what Paul is, um, is telling to young Timothy in uh, 1 Timothy 1, verses 12, 13, and 14, but it's applicable to us today. It says, For the which cause I also suffered these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I believed in, Believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Hold fast, what? The form of sound words. Keep the doctrine the doctrine. Don't change it. Don't suffer it. Listen, culture changes. We're fools if we don't change and adapt to the culture, but we don't change doctrine. We don't change doctrine. I've learned that working with these young guys. I mean, things of the way that I communicate, they have no clue what that is. So I can either fossil size and keep telling them about Nixon and the illustrations that they only know who those people are, Watergate and all those kind of stuff, or I can communicate to them the way that they receive information today. And a lot of that is by electronic or by visual or by something they can see or build or hold. And so we have to adapt, and, um, but we don't want to change the doctrine. We have to hold the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So we never suffer doctrine. But we have to be willing to change to reach the group. Uh, John was saying this to me the other day, and Harmony has been too for the last year. We need to get our website updated. Why? Because most people will find our church not by driving by. 
they're going to go on the internet and they're going to what? They're going to look and we need to come up. So I'm proposing we change the name of our church to AAA. So we'll come up first. <laughs> AAA, that's just because when you do that, it goes by alphabetical. So we don't want to be down in the F's, we want to be up in the A's. So they see us first. But um, you know what I'm saying, I'm just, just there. But that's how they find us now. That's, that's the way this younger generation looks. They let their, we let our fingers do the walking, right, with the yellow pages. They click on or they somehow get online and uh, use online. So we can't be afraid of that, but we can't use it to change doctrine, of course. And then he goes on in verse number 14, he says, That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. And that's the scriptures, that what's been committed to us. So in chapter number one, we're going to dive into this a little bit more deeper next week, but the, the overriding theme in chapter number one is guard the truth. Be serious about this. Don't be lax. Don't be silly. Don't be slick. Don't try to reach people by, 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 by ways that are ungodly. Give the gospel. That's what they need. That's what we need. So we see in chapter 1, these are the four things that are covered in there. We see Paul's greeting, and we see Timothy's life, a little bit about Timothy's life. And then we see God's precious truth, and then also our responsibility to hold fast that which is true. We're, we're responsible in our generation for the truth. So the perspective is the past, and Paul's um, tone is gratitude, and the theme is passing the ministry torch to Timothy and encourage for him to stay faithful in the midst of hardship. That no matter what you face, uh, be encouraged. And our key verse is 2 Timothy 1.14 that we already read. So uh, remain faithful all the way to the end. Don't quit. Hold the doctrine true. Don't suffer it. Chapter 2 is um, enduring suffering. That's the key thought in all of chapter 2 to endure suffering and so uh, 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 Paul is saying be strong be tough um, uh, we, um, we, we, we need to make sure that with the generation that we have now that we're, we're raising young men that can carry responsibilities and young ladies that can carry responsibilities. There was a, there was a man here today that was working on the uh, uh, alarm system and he was talking to me and he says he has two sons. He said the toughest thing is he goes, man, I can't believe this. He said my, my one son is 12 and my other son's 14 and I can't get him out of the basement and playing games. And so that's, that's what we have today. And I'll tell you what, Paul is saying, wait a minute here, if we're going to endure suffering, then we've got to raise our children to be a little bit tougher and a little bit more focused than they are now. We need to teach our young boys how to be men and our young ladies how to be ladies. And that's important. That's a responsibility that we have to have. So he's talking about the present, and he's talking, the tone is compassion. And the key verse, if um, Danny, can you read the key verses? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 3. Yeah, endure um, as a good soldier. It's um, it's difficult. In fact, um, let's look at that a little closer. Um, would you go ahead and um, uh, why don't you read um, uh, ch uh, chapter two, verses one uh, through um, through four? So the same chapter two, but read um, verse one through four. So basically what Paul's saying is it's a war out there. Uh, I, don't, I know we don't think that it is, but there really is a war for souls. There's a war for the souls of our family. There's a war 
uh, to keep our families together, everything that is good and wholesome and pure, Satan is destroying. He's tearing down these foundations that are so important. And, and, and so Paul goes on, he says, listen, no man that warreth and take himself with the affairs of this life. Did you know that the Roman soldiers were not even allowed to be married? They couldn't be involved in anything to do with uh, family, anything that would pull them away from the battle. And then after so many years, they were into a different position. They could be, but when they were first brought on, they had to stay single so that there would be nothing that would cause them to get entangled in this world or the affairs of this life. How about us? How many things are we involved in that really don't make any sense? That are really just pulling us away from accomplishing what God has for us. And so Paul says, well, listen, wake up. We're, we're, we're at war here, and we need to be ready. We need to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. So in, uh, in, in chapter number two, then, the key themes are, and we'll go through these more next week, is the passing, the passing on of truth. How's it going to get to the next person? And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same what? Commit thou to who? Faithful men who what? Shall be able to teach others. So we need to find men and women and we need to pour our lives into them so that they can pass on the truth. Pass on the truth. Uh, suffering for the truth. The illustrations are soldiers, athletes, farmers, workers, uh, utensils and servants. So all these right here Paul will use in chapter 2 to drive that home. And then in chapter number 3, we have um, remain faithful. Just be faithful. All the rewards in heaven are based on faithfulness. Just to be faithful to do what you're supposed to do. Listen, if, you're, if your mom tells you to get up in the morning and make your bed and wash your, wash your face, brush your teeth and put the dishes away, that's what you need to do. If you just get up every day and you do and just be faithful to what you know you need to do. Remain faithful. We don't need something new. We need the same message. We need to keep it fresh, but we don't want to compromise it. We want to just be faithful in our walk every day. Be consistent. Be consistent. Look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 14, 15, 16, and 17. All right, let's take a break here before we look at four, um, the, those verses. Is that, do you see what Paul's trying to do here? Here's the urgency. Is, is um, Paul saying, I'm leaving, but all these things are important. Who's going to carry this on? You know, Paul said at one time, he said, I have no man that I can pass this on to. He was discouraged. It didn't seem like there was a lot of people interested. And so it's the same thing today. And so we want to make sure Paul is just saying this is so urgent. So in verse 14 he says, But continue thou in the things which thou have, I have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And he goes on and says, all scripture is given by what? And is what? Profitable for teaching, doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Perfect, meaning mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So Paul says, stay faithful. Um, we're in the last days. Stand firm. Uh, make disciples. Uh, teach the next generation. And then chapter number four is uh, preach the word. That's, that's, that's the number, that's king. There's nothing greater in the local body of church than the preaching and teaching of God's word. That's what it needs to be, the preaching of God's word. It is the word that changes us. And in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering." And doctrine, and then in verse 3 it says, For the time will come when they will not, what? Endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teaching, having itching ears. Do we not see that today? We don't want the truth. We want to live our life the way we want to live it. We want to, we want to say we love Jesus, but we don't want to walk with Jesus. We want to live our own life our own way. And uh, that's what we see a lot of. And then in verse 4, 2 Timothy 4.4, 4, and they shall turn away their ears from truth. They shall be turned into um, fables. 
So, so, so chapter 4, the heading is Preach the Word. That's the key theme. And then these three points in there, is a, it's a solemn charge, a reason, uh, the reason for the charge, and then the personal uh, conclusion. And the, uh, and the key verse, of course, is 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. So that's as far as we'll go, go today. Um, but I uh, challenge you, until we meet again, uh, read uh, Timothy, maybe 2 Timothy, maybe three or four times, and, and think about this. Okay, where's Paul? He's in a dungeon. He's about to die. He's about 65 years old. He has a sentence of death. And he has this missile, he has this baton, he has this, and he wants to get this out because in his 65 years in traveling ministry, making three missionary trips, and all that he's been through, he says, this is what I want to tell the generations coming behind me. Get busy. Be faithful. Um, stay in the battle. Don't get entangled with the things of this world. Stay busy. Uh, like you know, I work with... Um, 18-year-olds to 22-year-olds every year. I have um, uh, anywhere between 25 and 30 young men each time. And what I have found over the 22 years is that the, 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 the guys that I'm getting today seem to do really well until they're about 10 or 11 years old. And then it seems like they're kind of like turned over to themselves to do whatever they want. And then somewhere around 17 or 18 years old, maybe they hear a message or God gets a hold of their heart. But from 12 to 18, look at all the entanglement that gets into their life, all the world that gets into their life. And to untangle that mess is difficult. And that's not God's plan. In fact, the Bible doesn't mention anything about teenagers in the Bible. He says, really, from age 0 to 12, and then once they get to 12, they're manhood. And they should be treated like a man. They ought to work. They ought to labor. They ought to be busy with their hands. They ought to start learning a vocation. They ought to be um, uh, 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 um, not lorded over, but pushed in the right direction, even at that young of an age. Because if the world gets a hold of them for seven, eight years, they can do a lot of damage. A lot of damage. And a lot of guys I get today, I get them in their broken furniture, and it takes us two weeks just to put the furniture back together. And they ought to be at 19, 20 years old, pretty squared away. Uh, but they're not. All right. Well, let's, let's um, take time to break up together. Um, oh, we're getting pretty late. Well, we'll just pray in here uh, today. Um, uh, uh, Sherry's out of surgery, recovering, but um, not able to go home yet. Uh, she just still has some difficulties, not in the surgery, I don't think, part of it, just the recovery. So we'll be praying for her. Um, you can give her a call. She'll answer her cell phone. Um, the visiting is hard because there's so many doctors coming in and out. Probably easier to just give her a call or a text and just you know, tell her you're praying for her or send her a letter or send her a card or give it to Bob and let him take it up to her. There's no need for meals yet, but I think sometime next week she should come home and then we'll, we'll prepare some um, meals. I'll be praying for Bops. Tomorrow's the open house, and uh, hopefully we'll have some ladies from the community come, right? That's the goal, and to uh, hopefully build this, and we can reach out in a tangible way uh, to the to the families in our uh, community. Um, take um, literature off of the table. There, we've passed out over half of them now. So grab some now before they're gone, and tell us what street you're going to do, and we'll mark it off and get those onto um, people's hands. Or just take five of them, and wherever you stop, pass them out. Okay, um, Randy, would you pray? And Craig, would you pray? Okay, Randy, would you pray first?